he, this is the end of Canadian Thanksgiving, and uh, we're doing really well this weekend. It's like we're right at the end of this big marathon, and we're really excited because um, we sold lots and lots. It's kind of like the season really begins with, uh, you know, the most busy weekend of the year, which is uh, Mother's Day. And then uh, the season ends <laughs> with the second most busy weekend of the year, which is Canadian Thanksgiving. And, you know, it's just, um, it's one of those occasions where lots of people are having big meals and people are having, you know, Mother's Day is like a single day. Um, but... Thanksgiving, you know, it's like this week, this year, it's like a four day weekend for, for our kids from school. And so that's like a Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, you know, potential holiday selling weekend. So Friday didn't really sell um, that much, but Saturday and Sunday and today have all been like quite strong. And, uh, you know, like less so today, everybody's kind of over turkey dinners at this point in time, I think. Um, so, you know, like sales are definitely less today compared to yesterday, but the farmer's market was, um, the Saturday market was our second biggest farmer's market ever. And, uh, we had an hour cause it was just me down at the market. Uh, we had an hour where, uh, I sold like a thousand dollars in a single hour. It was the busiest, craziest rush that I've ever experienced in like any sort of customer service. Uh, and, and some of the other, some of the other stands, uh, at this farmer's market, you know, like there's, there's one, um, like dessert cooking, uh, spot and they have like a lineup. It's crazy every single week for us. We don't have this like established order of, um, of an, a lineup. So we just have this like mass of people There were, you know, like the stand, uh, everything's like kind of facing out to the front. And I was behind at the back where the water was to bag up, you know, the, the plastic bags on the bottom of the bouquets as we sell them. And I could only stay at that station and then like do the transactions. And then I'd look up and I didn't even, I had no clue for that almost entire hour, what was going on on the front of the stand. I didn't even get to check it. And, uh, I was just crazy busy, you know, I think the, maybe the takeaway is you need to have a station set up at the front. For holidays, if for begging, it was right because then you could have talked to people. Well, like because you're you're so you're like invisible in the spot that I know you normally have set up. I was making eye contact. You know, I I I'd look up and stuff. It's just that I couldn't see the stand from the other side, and and so when I finally, you know, the, the rush kind of finished, I went and I looked and I was like, it was it looked full when this rush started. We were at we were still doing good. We sold eight hundred and eighty bucks or something in the first three hours. So it's not like things weren't. Yeah, it was you know, still a strong market. It was still like going good, but then it was like a thousand dollars in an hour, and like the whole time, five or six people, and and then as soon as I finished the transaction, I actually had no clue who was next, <laughs> because some people were like hanging out a long time, being cheesy. Other people were like, you know, grabbing, and sometimes people just have like a twenty, and they just want to get your attention. They're like, here you go, I got one of these. Here's your money, but then I'm like, do you want to bag water? And then they're like. Yeah, I do actually. So, <laughs> and and so then everything like gets slowed down. And you're I you're better at the customer service. I'm always I'm like, I'm like I wait for them to ask. Well, for I want the water. I don't I, I don't offer the. water. I want it to look as good as possible for them when they get home. So I don't I don't want it to uh, fall apart on the way. Um, you know, on on cooler days when it's like really cool out and yeah. stuff, I, I'm less pushy about it. But on days where I'm like. It's pretty hot and dry out there, so uh, yeah, because I'm like 20 to 30 minutes if you're going to be home in that time frame, no problem. But then, you know, th there was somebody like this past market, like on that market, and they came back to me later and they're like, uh, actually, I do. I, I want a bag of water. Can I get a bag of water? And, and so, yeah, there was like two $50 bouquets at the end of that rush left. And I don't know, maybe like Cause, a so dozen. Because for, for context we sent $2,000 worth of fresh flowers but we to, also... to the, the, cause this is Saturday to the market. And then we also had about $200 in dried flower pumpkins, Yeah, which we don't have any left. So I can't show you with it. <laughs> <laughs> and then we also had, um, just like our dried flowers. Cause, uh, a little while ago, Nellie put some time into making some like new stock for the dried flowers. So we still have some like, 
you know, really nice looking dried bouquets. Yeah, because I didn't even ask, did you sell dried flower yeah, like they, bouquets? Yeah, when we have dried flower bouquets that are like fresh, like not, I don't know, like free, recently made, recently made. Ones. In the, I'm, I'm like, I'm going to rephrase what you said to not hurt my feelings. Made in the style that sells the quickest. Well, right, because it's like they get they get picked through over time, right? And then and then, but they, it's like the pink ones always sell, the yeah. fastest. And, and then, so there's no pink left. They until... stop. They stop becoming like a product that I'm necessarily trying to sell, and more it's like this is some bulk, and then I'll use that to prop up the you know new good looking one, you know, in the front of the bucket for display or whatever. But um, you know, a little bit of everything sold. We sold almost twenty two hundred dollars by the end. Wow. And Correct. was it that hot? Because yeah. you know, you said it was like twenty. It's twenty one eighty five. Okay, I thought. You oh, maybe it was twenty eighty five. Maybe, maybe you're right. Maybe it was twenty one hundred, um, and it was twenty eighty five. But uh, at that point in time, we had no fifty dollars bouquets left, and we had no twenty dollars bouquets left, and and I think we I think there's one tiny like the smallest little pumpkin that survived a couple markets so far. Oh yeah. I'm yeah. like if it ha if I had it, if I could see it. I can go find it for you. Whatever it doesn't matter. But uh, it was it was an easy pack up, and, and I was like sold out with a bit of time left too. Um, so you know, like that that felt really good. Uh, it was, it's just it's just fun. And then you know the stand, it's like, it's, yeah, the it's stand was selling. Like while Ian was at the yeah. at the market, we we loaded up the stand Friday night. So it I, I stayed up till like five in the morning. Ian Ian got up to load and I was like oh my god I have to go to bed and then he was like can you actually like just stay up a little bit longer and, 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 and help um, so I like busted my butt trying to make as many bouquets as possible for the market and for the stand and then at um, two o'clock like I, or I left at one o'clock but at two o'clock there was a market in the neighborhood that I went to with the kids and so Ian went like straight from the farmer's market to me at my market to drop. The plan was he's going to drop off any of the leftover bouquets, um, which there was none. But he brought in like the good looking dried flowers and brought me like the, the card reader to be able to take credit cards. Um, and then I, I was there. He came back at like, dinner time, but we were at that market till like seven o'clock. And then we came home and I made bouquets all night. I made bouquets till four in the morning and had the stand. It was like, oh, it looks so good. And then we went out for for a dinner like in the afternoon. And then everyone came while we were gone because everyone was buying them for, uh, for their dinners too. And so we couldn't restock because we weren't home. But when we got back, we then like made even more uh, bouquets because lots of people do Thanksgiving on the Sunday, but some people do Thanksgiving on the Monday. And so we, we put, you know, another 30 bouquets into the stand for today. And at this point we're, if I wasn't doing the live video, I'd be making a few more, making a few more bouquets. Um, but yeah, in, in total. So what, what, what do we think we're at now? Ian? Like we're over 4,500. Yeah. So we're over, our goal is 5,000. And um, we've made over 4,500, so I'm allowed to, I'm allowed to round up. <laughs> um, but so, really exciting, really exciting weekend. You know, it's it's fun. Like Ian said at the beginning, it's fun to start the the season with Mother's Day, which is like the biggest day of the year, and kind of to end our fresh flower season with Canadian Thanksgiving which is like our second biggest day of the year. So, yeah. you know, it's these high notes. Yeah, this is what the stand okay. looked like. Yeah, the, the, the case up. When that was like the start of the market, and then... Uh, the it all sessions, this is so <laughs> funny. And then, yeah, that was it at the end. Like, <laughs> destroyed. Yeah, and, but, the, and the stand was like that you know, every what, night too. One of the fun things, though, is uh, like if you've been following us, probably you know we have that tunnel that's got all the dahlias in it that we planted for the end of the season, and then uh, there's this like scented. There's all these like scented geraniums that are in our landscaping, 
along the roadside. And, and so the, uh, the scented geraniums, they have like really nice, big, lush, beautiful green. Um, <laughs> and, they're, and they're like big and, and textured. Yeah. Right, so. It looks great, right? For da large dahlia for scale. So the, the bouquets, they were like large and colorful. Uh, this is uh, this is one colors one that we uh, Serena made last night. I was like, oh, that one's so cool. The dahlia and it was like gorgeous. This like look at that great that that dahlia that's in there is just amazing. Because all the a lot well, of it looks pretty good when this is what fall looks like. Yeah, a lot We're of. You're gonna these... try to leave some of your tubers in the ground up by winter. No, it's too cold. They they'll die here because uh, it would freeze. It freezes pretty deep for where we are. Um, if I was like zone seven, I'd experiment with it. But we're like we're a solid zone five A. Yeah, this was the stand last night. Because after load. after after you loaded it up, like, that was what it was looking like for this morning and then uh, and then we had to re like make more bouquets. Yep. All everything basically then we made another picture. So what did we do? We did another six or seven? Eight. Didn't we do eight? No, because I just I picked a handful of dahlias and then we used them. Did at least seven. Or six. Six. Yeah, okay, six. Yeah, so then you know like did another six and let's see what the sale looks like now. It's pretty empty. I would. I had to go pick my kids. Were at my parents. They took them home after Thanksgiving dinner uh, for a sleepover, and then um, and then I had to do a grocery shop. So. Yeah. so I rushed home for the live video. This this is the live camera shot of the stand and what it looks like now. So that's like that's like all the flowers left. But you know. we started picking. So we started prepping on Wednesday for the weekend. You, and you did like the marigolds really early, didn't you? I talked about doing it, but I didn't. Oh. Well, it <laughs> but been uh, the, on Wednesday, we were doing dried flower pumpkins. And, you know, we just, I mean, story of my life. I thought we were going to get more done every day than we did. But once I started picking on Thursday and like looking at everything, I was like, I don't think, because I was, I did. Oh, thanks so much, Jennifer. Thanks, Jenny. Uh, the, the goal. Goal, <laughs> um, was 5000 and then I started picking and I was like I don't think I have $5,000 worth of flowers left in the farm um, because this end of season time things start to get really picked over um, so I was kind of like Ugh. like I hope I at least have enough for 3000 yeah and so it feels like crazy yeah I'm sitting you... here still able to, um, to to do more if I wanted yeah, and, and all the dahlias that we picked, you know, we, we, you did a pretty good picking on the greenhouse. But because that that's like the first pick, that's like the first flush for a lot of those. Yeah, no, and a lot plants. of a lot of my dahlia plants haven't even bloomed. They don't even have the first. Yeah, that was there. That was only about two thirds maybe of the plants yeah. in the greenhouse. So in there right now, they would if there's like a bunch of really beautiful dahlias. Yeah, if it wasn't so late in the season. So the weather is going to make it so they'll never hit peak. But if it was like right now, September 1st, I would be saying two weeks from now will be peak. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So next year we'll time it so they're a little sooner. But, you know, it is fun to see the concept of having, you know, like the first flush come out in the fall mm -hmm. as opposed to yeah. in the heat of the summer. You know, and the plan was to plant them in, in, the beginning of June, and I didn't actually get them planted until the beginning of July. So, if I would have been on track for like June first planting, they that would have been the right time for them, because yeah. the plan is for them to be kind of available for the fall. Yeah. yeah. Somebody asked how much longer we can stand it before. So, it's going to go as long as we have flowers. We almost. Like, because we aim for Thanksgiving because most years we can hit, because Thanksgiving is like mid-October in Canada. Most years we can hit it without a frost, but it's like 
it's still like a 50-50 type thing. Um, so I have a few things on the farm that survive frost. So worst case scenario, I could put something together mm -hmm. for Thanksgiving. Um, like the dahlias in the tunnel. <laughs> yeah. But we almost, we had a night that went down to like one Celsius. Yeah. So I don't, also, what, I don't know what that is, like 34 in Fahrenheit? It's cold. So we almost already lost everything. And the next few days look good, but it it's kind of, it's a day by day um, assessment yeah. for fresh flowers at this point. But, because another question was like, what what's left for the season? And, and that's coming back to the title of this, is celebrate, celebrate Thanksgiving, but celebrate an even bigger milestone. Yeah. Um, we we've hit like 60 and like give or take we need, we haven't we haven't done the exact math yet but we think with having done the 5000 this weekend that we hit 60k for the year in sales mm -hmm. which was our goal for this year and we still have christmas season right so they like we have the potential and, and we have a lot more product like last year we sold like three thousand dollars, four thousand dollars, something in that range. At like this big, it's like a three-day at the hockey arena. You know, big open market, like way bigger than the, the farmers market, like a Christmas specialty. And uh, we and I think I, I at that market, I think I could do five thousand. Yeah. Right. Like when I bring the market research of last year. Because last year, a lot of the space was dedicated to uh, bouquets, like dried flower bouquets. And it was almost entirely okay. Christmas ornament sales. Uh, we'll get our Christmas ornaments to show up. Yeah, like Serena had like a nice spread of them, but it was basically just kind of like two, one or two tables worth of display space that was almost entirety of our sales. So if we can find, you know, better ways to display the Christmas ornaments, um, you know, I think there's more. Or like more selection. Too. More selection, yeah. yeah. More. Yeah, so we sold about $500 in dried flowers um, in the bunches, and partially because I sold two hundred dollar Yeah, you had, you had like big decadent so, ones. So like, there wasn't a lot of volume yeah. leaving, and then we sold like almost $3,000 in the in the Christmas ornaments, right? And so like these are, like, the light is kind of hard to see them, but can kind of see right like this this is all like one color it's kind of like antique rose and then i did like a rainbow mix and i had i had white oh they're breaking on me i had a white and i had purple oh, where is this? i had purple purple colored ones i think i had like five different colors um you know, and we're going, we're going to go even harder on that. And then we're also, we're going to sell them in other places. We're going to try to do more than just. Yeah. And then we're going to sell some Christmas products through the stand, you know, these. Yeah. We're going to do wreaths and like, you know, outdoor greenery. Maybe and mushroom decor. Well, that's for next year. Get Leah started Yeah. on her new business idea because she she got lazy about cards. Yeah. She's now on to bird cards. I think we should take over the card business. I think we should take over the card business this winter. This winter, we, we print out a series of cards so that we don't have to hand make them every time. We yeah. just have a thousand cards stored somewhere down here. Yeah. yeah. I apparently got an outside card. I know. You got a cuddly Kaya. He's, he was like, there's a cat stand right over there, and he's like upside down, like staring at me. Kaya doesn't have like bones in his body. He just seems to like like cats are flexible, but he's like you know your double jointed friend who can like you know bend completely backwards in their joints. That's what Kaya seems to be able to do, and uh, so he'll like lay on the cat stand and look at you in these like ridiculous, stupid ways. But when he's when Carl's in the house, he's like a grumpy. Oh yeah, he growls. He, he's like you walk by him and he like growls at you. 
Yeah. But if he gets to go outside, then he's happy. Yeah. And he likes sleeping on, we have a couch in our bedroom. And that's his bed. So. But if he comes in the house and our bedroom door is closed, then he comes downstairs. And he, he's also, <laughs> he's, uh, he's ridiculous about shadows. Um, he's, a, he's a shadow hunter, is what I like to call him. So in the morning when I'm getting the kids up, uh, you know, like I get up and I have my flashlight on my phone. And okay. in the summertime, when like the days are long, and the sun's already, you know, kind of up. I don't need to do that. But, you know, now that we're into the like dark fall winter days, I start my flashlight up. And then as like all the shadows are going around the room, Kaya suddenly like he doesn't understand shadows like that. And he like chases after them everywhere. So then I'll like walk by the banister and like the hallway uh, in our in our upper in our top floor there, and I'll put the light you know like on the other side of it, and I'll like walk along, and then he's like ah, ah. just like chasing shadows everywhere. He's he's not the smartest, but okay. So to get back to the ornaments, I see you guys' comments. The goal is to ship them. The goal is to sell like sell them as like a four pack. And have them available. Yeah. For like, because that was kind of last year, I bought lots and I was like, okay, I'm going to try to make it so we can finally have like a product that we can ship out like, to all you guys that, that want to support us. Um, and we've been like, I've been saving up lot, lots and lots of uh, like stock to be able to make lots of them. Mm -hmm. You know, so I do. Oh, you want to show off the, the dry flower room? Well, not really. Because <laughs> I, I don't want to haul this thing All around. the racks of, uh, of the straw flowers? But you go grab one of the trees. Because that's just what it looks like. Yeah, I have like dry, I have dry flowers everywhere. Tis the season. Tis the season to have dry flowers everywhere. Oh, people are complaining about the air conditioner. Yeah, so this is like a tray of straw flowers. We have them all over the place. You know, I think uh, these these are kind of like some of the most valuable ones for us. These these kind of like smallish ones because uh, they actually go in the holes at the top of the uh, yeah, I'm like, of the ornaments. You know, like unlike these ones. That are like massive. Yeah. But I have new products. I have a new product line to be able to use up my plant. I'm gonna make wax. I don't know sachets, sachets. I don't know. But like wax blocks that you then press dried flowers into, so that it can be like a scented. It could you could hang it on your Christmas tree if you wanted, or it can be you know like a car air freshener okay i also have like buckets like this all over the place yeah so yeah like one of two of those trays or like a, a tray and a half is becomes like this much yeah a Lots. bunch of our a bunch of our racks with the grow lights right now have just that dried flower you know straw flowers yeah. on them basically uh, so you know we've got a lot more volume to be able to sell this year. And uh, I think there's gonna be some some great looking stuff. And we'll have the time to do it too. I bought 2,000 empty balls. That was enough. So that was in last year's expenses. Yeah. So. And how much if you sold all of those? $20,000. $20,000. Because they're $10 each. No. I think, um, I think, I think it'll, that we'll still be able to do some reasonable sales. Yeah. Yeah. So okay. Back. Oh, I'm back. Gonna, I'm gonna get okay. going. You're gonna go. Yeah. Okay. Is there anything? Uh, I was just gonna say quickly. Uh, we're working on another video. It's hopefully gonna be out soon. Uh, Thanksgiving, kind of. Yeah. We just we diverted all attention to to doing this weekend, right? Um, but now we can start getting our focus back onto the backlog of videos. This next video is. We still have like August. Is like where. <laughs> This, this where, next, where we're editing. This next it. video is the video after we got evacuated and then we went to the farmer's market. Like the first farmer's market back from the after evacuation. Because the last video we did uh, where we were dropping the trees, that one's kind of out of the timeline. That one was like 
we just filmed that one and then edited it because uh, we had to get it out for ad timing stuff. And so now we're like going back and working chronologically. So in case you wonder where the time break is, but it's the footage is gorgeous. Like the flowers are amazing. I know already at this point, looking back, you know, we're, we're a little behind. So they're like, there's stuff to come. But at the same time, we also have lots of projects that we're going to be doing yeah. that'll have videos coming out. So, you know, I figure like up until like, you know, October, November, we're going to have like some, some really great videos. Yeah. And we're done. We're done with markets now too. Like we'll be doing some like Christmas type markets, but the Saturday clone farmers market, that's, that was it for us for this year, this past uh, Thanksgiving. So, you know, we'll be able to start pumping through working through all those old videos and you know, we filmed a lot so yeah <laughs> we're excited yeah it'll be fun and also we got a secret we can't talk about secret product oh you're making it sound like i'm pregnant i'm like what are you talking <laughs> about <laughs> like yeah i know you're like we have a secret that, that we can't talk about that will never ever be our gossip anymore yeah. <laughs> there's no there's no pregnancy announcements in our future you're being so cryptic that i didn't even know what you were talking about i know well i don't know if you want to talk about it yet, no but... i don't so it's a secret <laughs> we have a secret that i'm yeah. not ready to talk about yet that isn't me being pregnant that is exciting yes but we're not going to talk about it no so and, you and that's about what... it <laughs> well yeah i know right okay <laughs> um Okay, but I want to, okay, and I, like, I've been reading all of your guys' comments. Yeah, so. Okay. Um, so, the wax things that we're going to do, and I'm, I'm looking around because I have, like, everything down here, but, um, because I bought molds, so the plan for those, and I've never done them before, but I, I did a bit of research to be able to, because I'm like, okay, if we're going to do this, we got to do it soon, um, because basically in October, we have to start making products for for craft fairs for over christmas um but so the trick with them so you can put scent into them because you you mix it into the wax and i have like i have essential oils to be able to scent stuff um from my soap from my soap making so i didn't have to buy any scents to have on hand though i might want something christmasy i, might, I don't know that i have a pine or anything like that um but so you mix it into the wax and then you don't use like soy or um, kind of the waxes that are really good for candles for these types of products because what you want is a really hard wax. Um, a lot of the other like good for burning waxes. Oh, oh cute. Come up here. Both sad. I'm talking, I'm talking to the phone. But the tripod is on the table, so you can't rub against it and shake the shake the camera around. Um, but yeah, so the research that I did was saying that um, you get like a like a really high melt point paraffin wax are the waxes that are going to be best for that. Because then um, you know if they're in a spot and like if you have them in your car. Um, it's not going to start to melt if like you have the hot air on. Um, you know, just to keep the product a little bit safer from damaging. And then oh, I saw this trick that is like amazing. You buy an old coffee maker and then you like fill the coffee maker up with wax and you have it on like, you know, hot, like keep it hot mode. And so then you can just have like the wax in the jug on the heater and they're so cheap to buy. Um, and then you just pour it out as you need it back onto the heater. But then it's, you know, it's in a, it's a, crafting station that I can set up um, in in my outbuilding space to be able to pump out a bunch of these because I bought about like 10 molds um, so you know kind of like pour the wax in and then decorate it with the flowers and then like next one <laughs> um, so that'll be exciting um, yeah and then like the Christmas ornaments you know I, I know that we have we have lots of you know like we're showing you the volume that we have um but at the same time you know when we're talking about doing like 2000 of these just to fill the the um the, the supplies that i have on hand that's without even you know potentially purchasing in more bowls you know like half a cup 
her thing starts to equal to like, you know, mountains and mountains of them. And um, I'm also hoping that ideally, because I grew three full beds of straw flowers and I've only just been saving the flower heads off of it. I haven't been hanging them to dry the stems at all because I was like, nope, just for crafting. This makes it easier. This makes it more manageable. Um, and my hope is that I grew enough this year that I can grow only two beds worth um, for next year that I'll like, I'll actually have stock left over because the great thing about the dried flowers for me, because we're so dry here, is as long as I get it into, into a dark spot, then I don't, the product is great. It's kind of only when it's open and exposed um, that it starts to fade or get dusty or anything like that. So, so that's exciting. Okay, so yeah, lots of Christmas. Cause, so I, I wanna go back to the title of the video. Um, so last year we sold $52,000. That was our like total um, gross sales. Um, we made minus $5,000 because I spent 60,000. But so the plan for this year was to try to hit $60,000. We were changing some stuff. Um, so we weren't really pushing for the sales to, to grow too much. We knew we still like are kind of trying to figure out exactly where the sales are going to come from. Um, so we didn't want to give ourselves like a outside of the doable ballpark um, number. And I'm like, that was distracting me. Just poof, what I was talking about just left my head completely. Um, yeah, so goal was 60,000. Oh, okay. And then the farmers markets this year have been really down. Um, we're, we're kind of doing like $800 at a farmers market instead of $1,200 at a farmers market. You know, we've had farmers markets that are 600, 700, you know, 800 is like as good as it gets this year. Um, so I was, I was nervous at how the numbers, oh, Bo found a way to knock the camera around. Um, I was nervous about how bad the final number was going to look with how low each individual market was. Um, but when, because I started looking at some of the numbers about two weeks ago, when I looked at the numbers, we'd been so consistent on the markets. We'd done pretty much every single weekend. We hadn't really missed very many weekends this year. Um, and because of that, the total sales is comparable to last year, even without the per market sales being quite as high. Um, and then the stand has been, you know, at, as strong or stronger than last year. Um, so like we did it, we made it. And, and I saw the comment about like, how does the employee factor into that? Cause that is one of the things we were talking about, um, you know, not necessarily having an employee and still pushing for the 60,000 this year. And, and like, so, and Nellie has a cost and Nellie's going to be here over the winter. Um, so, so that cost isn't, isn't as seasonal as maybe like other, other employees might be. Um, but I knew that going in. And so part of the reason why, like we're working on developing a bunch of these dried flower products and like, we're going to be doing a lot of things with dried flowers and why I'm even like contemplating doing shipping is partially because I'm going to have like Nellie here working with me and being, you know, an extra, extra, extra person's worth of hours um, over this off season to be able to um, still get a bunch of stuff done. Oh, he's like a stand. He always comes and rubs on the tripod, but he jumped onto the table to shake my folding table around to rattle the bow. You're not supposed to do that. And then he's like purring right into, right into the microphone. You're so loud, Bo. Your purr is so loud. Um, yeah. Okay. So we're at 60,000. Obviously there's a cost to the employee, but we also like, like we're saying, we're going to do these things that we've kind of never really done before. You know, I do have 2000 um, of these Christmas baubles on hand, which if they all sold um, at full price, that's $20,000. 
in sales, right? And so I'm, I'm not sitting here going, okay, well, like my 60,000 plus $20,000. Um, but I am sitting here going, okay, like, you know, it is reasonable to say that we're going to do $5,000 at this craft fair um, that's coming up in the beginning. Yeah, decoy tripod. Well, I do have a decoy tripod. It's over there, but he doesn't rub on that one. Um, yeah, so, you know, I, I think there's a good chance that we could do a couple thousand dollar craft fairs with the dried flower stuff and then have the big $5,000 like weekend long fair, um, you know, and that's not even factoring in doing some shipping for the Christmas ornaments. The other thing that we're gonna do to finish off the season, and, and I think we mentioned this also, is we're gonna do like greenery. And so like $50 Christmas wreaths in the stands, you, Ian, Ian's a little bit of a non-believer when it comes to Christmas wreaths, but I'm like, listen, like we only, we only need 20 people to buy these Christmas wreaths and and it's a thousand dollars, right? Um, you know, and like 20, 20 customers is is not not a big ask. We we figure we probably have, you know, like a hundred or two hundred regular customers that are using the stand. So, you know, it's like, oh, if we could convince you know, 25% of them, if we could get 50 people to buy one of these reads, that's $2,500. If we did like a green, like an evergreen arrangement for around Christmas time, you know, there could be like a couple thousand dollars worth of sales in that too. You know, plus having having these kind of things in, in the stand also. So I'm just, I'm really excited. I'm really excited for um, being on track. Right, you know, it, like my my head's been I've been head down, focusing, just just uh like stargazing at flowers, um all summer, just you know, just trying to keep the season on track, and you know now that we're at this like coming up for air point, um you know I'm surprised looking back over my shoulder, uh how much distance I made in my in my swim so yeah so exciting um yeah <laughs> yeah but the camera shaking making you nauseous oh my try the problem is so my my phone i bought a new phone this is i like i hate the tripod shake it drives me crazy so i i am i empathize but um i bought this new phone and i have to have i have to have Okay, I'll talk about buckets after. Um, I have to have an OtterBox Defender case because phones get trashed because I have kids and I it's like a work tool. So it needs to be really, really strong, but then the case is like, pfft, makes the phone so big. So my phone, my phone is like literally like, okay, let's see. My phone is this big. It's like massive. <laughs> it's like the size of a tablet almost. Um, and so when I bought the phone, I couldn't find any like, any holders for the phone to be able to attach it to a better tripod so it doesn't shake around. This tripod that I'm using is one of the few tripods um, that actually had like a cell phone holder big enough to hold my cell phone, but it like doesn't weigh anything. And then Bo, the problem with Bo is like I'm talking at the camera and and so he gets jealous. So he the reason why he rubs on the tripod is because he's like, oh, you're giving that thing attention when you should be giving me attention. Um, so he's he's doing it because he wants to be like what I'm what I'm talking at. But so one of these days, one of these, this is this is what it comes down to. One of these days, I'm going to figure out how to properly live stream using cameras and a computer. I'll like build like a live stream studio in my office, which I've talked about doing for two years and then things will look and sound a lot better, but it's, it's not gonna, it's, it's not on the 2023, uh, list of, uh, of tasks. Okay. So buckets, the bucket that I get to ask all the time is what, where, what are these buckets here? And they are, um, now I'm brain farting because milking pail was, was in the comment and yeah, basically, basically they are a milking pail. 
they're like a stainless steel oh, what's the word i'm like <laughs> it's like just not in my head um what kind of bucket are they there's a word feed bucket that's what they're called so a stainless steel feed bucket and okay i'm coming back i'm getting i'm getting examples of why they're so great I'm a big old sellout. Okay, so the yeah, and the specific spot that I get them from is Princess Auto, um, which like I'm Canadian, so you know Princess Auto has them. But anywhere that you would buy like farm supplies, like if you're down in the states, anywhere that is like a farm store would have them because they are a feed bucket, and they're gonna be like clumped in with like other farm supplies. It'll be like, oh, beside the bottles that you feed the cows is, is this. Oh, thank you so much, Agita. Oh, thanks. Um, yeah, so the thing that makes the feed bucket so great is, first of all, stainless steel, right? They last forever. And a lot of these buckets I have had for five years now. I've had them since the beginning because our, our plan with the display all along was metal, um, cause we were a little concerned about food safety and cleanliness. So we wanted, we used metal because we ended up buying display trays that were, um, that were from restaurant supply stores because we wanted to, um, we wanted to <sighs> brain farting here. Sorry guys. Um, we wanted, we wanted to be able to sanitize anything that the food touched, keep everything clean, keep everything good. Um, and then we ended up going for these buckets because the plan all along was mostly vegetables and then a few flowers. And we went for these buckets because these buckets matched our stainless steel vegetable display. Um, but you know, now, and then it just, it became the look that everything is, is the stainless steel. But so I have a bunch of these buckets that are five years old. They'll get filled with water. They'll sit around the farm for like the entire summer. I actually have one of these outside near my um, seedling, my seedling um, station. So like I water at, like every single day. There's always like seedlings that are still growing out. And I have one of these that I keep, that every day I fill up with water because this is like a cat water bucket. So I'll have one of these that for like four months of the year is filled with water. And I only have one bucket that has any sort of damage, like water damage to it. Right. So, and the one that I have, um, I think that there's a good chance that I accidentally like had it filled with like plant material and water and I fermented something and the, and so it got acidic and then the acidity like <laughs> over the course of an entire summer, like ate out some of the stainless steel finishing and then started to make it so tiny, tiny little specks of like rust could start in it, but it's still like so good. And then because of the stainless steel, same idea as for like when I did it with the food, um, they're very easy to sterilize, like washing them. They clean up really, really nicely, which means that when I store flowers in them, um, it, they don't storing inside those buckets doesn't affect the, doesn't affect the stem quality. Um, cause I can have nice, clean, easy to clean, um, good quality buckets. So they cost a million dollars um, for me at this point, this size of bucket, um, cause this is the bigger bucket. They have like a smaller size and then they have one that's even bigger, but this size of bucket for me is $25 plus tax. So it's like they, they're almost, they're, they're almost $30 each. So they, they are really pricey, especially cause at this point, like every year I need more of them. So it's like, I've spent thousands of dollars on these buckets. Um, but in the long run, because I imagine that I'll like easily be able to use them before kind of retiring them out for like 15 years. Um, you know, when I divide the per year cost plus, you know, all the benefits that I get out of them, 
they're they're really yeah i've spent a million dollars on buckets um okay and then i wanted to show you guys this bucket because this is the type of bucket that is uh is a lot easier to find and that these type of buckets are a lot more affordable um but the problem with going for the galvanized buckets is um even if they will hold water and so this bucket this bucket does hold water it is watertight or um i should say this bucket was water type um because or water tight i went to use this um on on friday night and i filled the bucket up and then by the time i came back to look at it there was a flood in my outbuilding because it um it has a hole at some point you know and these i use like very very rare these, I bought these only purely for doing our $40 bouquets. Um, the, our $40 bouquets are so big, I can only fit one, maybe two into these buckets. Um, and then they're difficult for Ian to handle them. So these buckets I bought specifically for $40 bouquets. This, I can fit um, three $40 bouquets into this, and then it's easy for Ian to transport it. So these, they only get filled up on like a Friday night and then they get emptied out like on a Saturday afternoon. And, um, you know, and I probably use this bucket like 20 times and it's already like rusted out on the inside. Um, it's difficult to clean. I don't necessarily trust the, the galvanized steel, um, buckets to not be negatively affecting negatively affecting stem length quality if they get stored in there for you know for very long um so sometimes something that seems expensive um once you start to actually like break down the per year cost um these start to be a, a pretty great deal um a grown man's dollar store <laughs> well nothing's cheap in canada so so I don't know. I don't know if Princess Auto is down in the States. Um, I will say this, you can't find these buckets anywhere else. So it is the cheapest place to find the, the feed buckets. Yeah, I need a traveling tinker to fix all my buckets. Well, it, but it still has the problem of the fact that it's, it's galvanized. It's galvanized and so it's garbagey. So what I, what I really need is I need to like get a, like a liner for it eight dollars well that's amazing like things that cost eight dollars in canada mm -hmm. i'm like is there anything is there anything in here that's cheaper than eight dollars actually yes okay so um and for context canada um to buy a five gallon bucket is eight dollars that's like how much like a like a, a like a large bucket is they used to be, they used to be $5, but since COVID they've gone up. Okay. This, this was less than $8. And so, cause someone was asking about this. Um, I bought these the other day because I was walking through the hardware store and they had like a whole pallet of these and this, it was, um, they're garbage cans, right? So it's like a little, little garbage can. And what were they? They were... I think they were $12 for a two pack. So there you go, $6 bucket in Canada. And the reason why I bought them is that the shape, this is like the best shape for a bucket. Um, this like the square sides, uh, like I know it's kind of a joke that I have all these like kitty litter buckets. They, they all came from my mom, um, but I love, I love the straight sided square buckets because they make it so that you can pack stuff in. I'm like, give me around in buckets. All right, so that when in the cooler, um, because we're at the point now that we can, we can get to needing to get a lot of stuff in the cooler um, when we want to like move things around in vehicles and stuff like that, or even in, in the cart when I'm picking, um, when you have these rounded buckets and they go together, there's like a lot of like empty space, you know, and then like, so they leave, they take up a lot of a lot of space around them anything that's rounded whereas the square buckets the square buckets they can they can go flat right they flatten up tight to each other so they're really good for maximizing storage space and then this this like rectangle space 
our shape. I really, really like for harvest buckets because, so when I take flowers, I'm like, okay. So when I take a flower and I put it in, they fall over, right? And so in a round bucket, they all fall over everywhere. And so things start to kind of angle. But so because it's this like rectangle shape, I can kind of put them in and then angle them this way. And then, and then once it starts to fill up halfway, I'll then put my hand in and then I'll push them so that they're straight and then I'll finish filling up the bucket. Um, but so the rectangle shape bucket is, is really efficient for filling buckets and it's also really efficient for removing stems out of the bucket. Like a, the problem with a round bucket like this, and I have like, like water, water everywhere. I have plants everywhere, but okay. So the problem with a round bucket, and, and these are the type of things that like you don't think about in the first couple of years, but then you're in year five and then you get real picky and you're like, it annoys me, so I'm gonna spend money to get a problem. So a round bucket, you put it in and then it falls, right? And then I get another one and it falls and this isn't flat, right? But then you get another one and you put it in and it falls in a different spot and you get another one and it falls in a different spot. And then when you actually look inside the bucket, the stems, Another bit of thunder outside. Um, yeah, so then when the stems all go in the bucket, they, they get all tangled together. And so then if I go to my bucket full of stems and I try to, oh, I'm just gonna pull this out, then it just, everything falls out and they go everywhere and they're all tangled and it makes a big mess. And then I get grumpy and I'm like, this is a waste of time. It makes me so angry. Yeah, how passionate I am about buckets. Bucket, like buckets matter. You know, you spend 10% of your time washing buckets when you're a flower farmer. Um, so the, it's worth getting the right bucket. But yeah, so round buckets actually are really inefficient for me when I'm like harvesting into the bucket or when I'm even like working with them for pulling stems out of the bucket. So it's worth it for me to, to get the, the straight sided. My dream bucket, which I'm excited. I was like, oh, I'm like spending all my money right now. And I, I'm like, I don't have enough money. I have to like hold myself in. But my dream bucket, one of these days when I stop spending all my money on perennials and buying thousands and thousands of Christmas ornaments, uh, when I have a little bit more room in the budget, what I really want to buy is the Procona buckets. And they're, they're a professional, yeah. <laughs> my, they're my bucket list bucket is, is the Procona buckets. And they're a rectangular bucket. And then they, they're bigger than this. And they have like holes in the side. So you can like got a really good handhold. And they look like they're like the perfect like, because this is the other thing. This is one of those things that you don't think about until you do 50 pound lifts all day. Um, Okay, I need more props. Okay, this and like, grr, this is my rant about farming isn't isn't designed for women, right? Because women's shoulders are like this wide, and so if you want to do a strong lift, right? It's like like when you put your feet shoulder width apart you're like strong and sturdy on your feet. Like people are less likely to push you over. And so it's the same, like if you put your arms shoulder width apart, you're, you're gonna have like the strongest, most stable lift. And so women's shoulders, you know, even if you got big shoulders, are like lady shoulders aren't as wide as like men's shoulders because they're bigger than us, right? If you're five feet tall instead of 10 feet tall, and this isn't a women's problem. This is a tools are made for six foot tall people who are strong, not five foot tall people. And there is a lot of men and there's a lot of women who are five feet and therefore they need tools that are sized to their bodies. Um, but so if you try to do a lift with something that is too wide, right? Then, then it's like really difficult. You're like, oh my God. And cause it's like, instead of like using like, oh, the chest and the back for your lift, um, you start using 
like your your like arm muscles and your arm muscles aren't efficient right it's like it's like lift there's like a crazy thunderstorm going on outside it's like crazy thunder it's like shaking the building um yeah is and it's like you know it's like lifting like oh you like you want to be like really strong in your core for lifts as it's, it's the same idea you can't do any of those things if you're like lifting something this wide, right? So like these crates here, these I absolutely love because look, look at this. It's like exactly, exactly the size of my shoulders, right? So these buckets and they have like little handhelds, right? So this is, you, you put like 50 pounds of stuff into this crate and like, pff, I can lift this all day. Like this, this is easy. This is no problem for me. Like, cause I'm strong, we're all strong. We're doing these like 50 pound lifts all day. It's no big deal. But if you get, and I'm like, where? Cause I know I have them in here. Yeah, I don't have them. But th these are, this is a good example, right? Cause these are, these are also really common, right? So like, people use these in farming, right? And then look, look where my shoulders sit on it, right? They're too wide, right? So for this, you put 50 pounds in this and I can't lift this all day, right? Because it's just that, just that little bit wider than this, right? Just having my hands up just a little bit further instead of in tight and strong, engaging my core. This, I can up, down, up, down 50 pounds, no problem. The Rubbermaids or the thing that I was trying to show you guys is the, the, the totes, the, they're called like lugs when they're listed. The lugs that they sell for farming in, in our local farm store, they're exactly the same as the Rubbermaid. They're just that little bit wider. So they don't actually hold any more than my smaller, than my smaller crates because my smaller crates are a little bit deeper. Um, but just, you know, if you find, you gotta find the right tools. You gotta think about these things, notice these small differences with your body, and then like, then when you find the right thing, you go for it. But Procona, Procona, you know, perfect. They're the perfect, they're not too big. They're not like out super wide. So the perfect size for lifting, I could, I could lift them all day. Um, and then they have like venting, so you don't have to worry about like stems getting gross when they're in the cooler. It just keeps the quality of the stems up a bit higher. And then they have like, like a system for being able to stack them, right? So you have like the Proconas are like this, and then you can like put like a cardboard like ring around it and then a lid, and then you can like put like another Procona on it because, um, you know, the goal is to, you know, if you can get $1,000 into your delivery vehicle, like that's great, but if you can get $2,000 into your delivery vehicle instead of having to take two, two delivery ones, like that is, that's how you make the money, right? So having these like buckets that like stack on each other, yeah, they're, I'm like, oh, and like, so someone was saying that they have them at Johnny's. And so I was drooling over them. But so the problem is like Canada. I don't, I don't remember if they shipped them to Canada, but if they did, it would like the shipping would be insane. It would be like so expensive. Um, so I really need to have a Canadian source for them. Um, but the farm, the farm store, like the farm, like Canadian farm supplier um, that we use I was on their website the other day and they, they're like, they have them. They're not, they're like a special buy. You have to like contact them to, um, to see, but we, we often like order an entire pallet <laughs> from them. So to be like, to be like, oh, it's a half pallet. The difference, the shipping costs for a half pallet versus a full pallet are um, very, very little, especially when it's something light, like empty buckets. Um, so Oh yeah, reach out and see if they'd sponsor me. I don't think so. I'd, I I imagine, even though I could talk for an hour, or I let's be honest, I could probably talk for 10 hours about buckets. Um, I don't I don't know how how keen 
uh, bucket companies would be on <laughs> on sponsoring me. <laughs> well, I gotta try. I gotta try with. Uh, gotta try with uh, like plant companies first. Be it, like get uh, get like proven winners to sponsor me to help me fill up my my perennial field um, before I start making pitches. Once once I got like I'm like oh I'm sponsored by proven winners and. You know, it could be like, Paul, Paul, sponsor me. I love you guys. I keep buying all of my, my seedlings from you and I want to like teach everyone in Canada what a great source you are. Um, get sponsored by them and then I can be like, hey, Procona, you may know me as being sponsored by these other companies. <laughs> um, but yeah, my bucket bucket list, probably not next year, which is why I bought these like these garbage cans. I bought 12 of them because I needed more buckets because my five-year-old kitty litter buckets are starting to UV, <laughs> UV damage um, and, and disappear. Okay, um, it's been an hour, but I, I will stay a little bit longer. Um, I know I just ranted about buckets for 15 minutes, but um, if you guys have any questions, we can, we can do questions. Um, you know, we, I know we haven't done a live video. <laughs> bucket, bucket list. Yeah, uh, we haven't done a live video in in quite a while, um, <clears throat> and I made I made a community post talking about it. Um, but I know like like I don't I don't see community posts when I'm when I'm on uh, when I'm on YouTube. So I understand that other people don't either. But uh, with back to school, my daughter um, joined Girl Guides, and her her Girl Guide meeting is on Monday nights, and so. <clears throat> um, we're, that's, uh, that's a great question. Um, we're, we're just, uh, we're getting used to the new back to school schedule. Ian and I just, uh, we, we've just been like so busy with the farm and then the kids being in school that the Mondays, it's just, you know, it'll be like, oh, it's like eight o'clock on a Monday and we forgot that we had to do a live video. Um, yeah, I'm sorry, I'm looking at the chat. But yeah, so today's a holiday, which like I was like, okay, for sure we can do it, but we're gonna try to get back into into re like trying to get the Monday lives going again. We really like mo doing it on the Mondays, um, so um, we're gonna we're gonna try to stick to that and just just make it work. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Okay, let's see. Okay, so I have I have the chat paused, um, but I'll scroll through it. So for questions, and so I'll just like work my way down. Um, but if I'm not like responding to what you have, it's because it's because I have it paused. So um, the question is, are you cutting any flowers on your grow list next year? Um, and so, so for this year, my goal for this year in in how I chose things is what I'm looking for is to increase the value of stems while decreasing the number of stems in the bouquets because that is the way to make things move quicker in the bouquet arranging in the bouquet arranging period of time right so like i'm the it's been five years and like honestly it's only been like last year and this year that i've been doing full-time flowers um but at this point you know i'm kind of like well there's not going to be too much improvements on like picking speed um you know and and like like field management you know it's kind of like i can i will obviously improve you know i haven't done ten thousand hours yet i've only done you know <laughs> of picking well i don't know maybe Maybe I've done 10,000 hours. I'm like, how many, how long is my season? 25 weeks times seven is uh, 175 days of picking. Um, and, you know, how much, like, per day, probably average to like three hours of harvesting per day. Some days are really, or maybe even less. Yeah. I still got a few more years until like my 10,000 hours to say that, okay, I'm, I'm as good as it's going to get. I'm fully trained on picking. Um, but yeah, so the, the, the 
speed at which I'm making bouquets needs to improve. And the only way that I can make the speed of the bouquets go quicker is if instead of putting, you know, 18 $1 stems into the bouquet, I put nine $2 stems or better yet, six, you know, like two $75 stems. Um, and so before, because space was a limitation, more than anything else. Um, my goal was to produce the highest number of stems in the field, um, whereas now I'm less concerned about like the dollar per square footage that I'm getting off of the farm because my square footage is more than I can really manage <laughs> well. Um, at this point, like if, if I maximized the entire farm, I could probably be producing like $250,000 in, in retail stamps. And like, I'm, I don't have sales for that. And it would take an insane amount of labor to produce that much. So rather than, you know, try to scrape the most out of the field, what I'm looking for is um, ways that I can still go, get a good dollar value out of the field, but then bringing down the labor, right? So at this point, space isn't my most finite resource. At this point, um, labor hours are my most finite resource. So I, starting last year, I started like really analyzing um, labor per, per dollar, per like, so instead of being like, like per stem, right? So you can like labor per stem, um, is important to know. And then price per stem is, in, oh, brain started. Um, price per stem is important to know, but, um, if, you know, I'm like, where's zinnias? I'm going to complain about zinnias for a second. I, I don't have any. I sold every single zinnia stem. Um, okay. But let's, okay. These, these make me money, but we're gonna pretend that this is a zinnia. And zinnias make me grumpy because I'm starting to realize they're not as great as I thought they were because zinnias don't actually sell for a very high dollar point. Um, but the labor that it takes to get a zinnia to market is, is quite high. Um, because they're, they're a single flower stem, so like this, and this, like, for example, sca this Scabiosa um, picks infinitely easier, has way less disease issues, and it sells for twice as much, and is desirable to florists when zinnias aren't, right? So this, this Scabiosa has a lot of benefits to it. The downside of this Scabiosa versus a zinnia is that this Scabiosa will only produce you know, like per square foot, you know, like let's say 10 stamps a year. Um, whereas the zinnias, you know, I could, I could potentially get 20 zinnias per square foot. Um, but if the 10 Scabiosa sells for the same, if Scabiosa sells for twice as much as zinnias, um, the 10 Scabiosa per square foot is actually the exact same dollar value as the 20 zinnias per square foot and the labor that it takes for me to get this the the 20 dollars worth of scabiosa versus the 20 dollars worth of zinnias um in you know the the labor hours to turn this into money in my pocket is way lower on the scabiosa than it is on the zinnias so what i need to do at this point is to start analyzing all my crops considering that, right? And so, you know, we're gonna pretend that this is a zinnia. We're gonna say that this isn't very high value and it's it's fussy to pick um, because you have to pick it and then you have to strip the stem. And the thing, so the thing that makes zinnias fussy to pick is that they're very brittle, they're very, they're very breakable. So 
You have to pick them slower than other flowers because you have to be careful not to damage them because if you damage them, then they're garbage. And even when you're handling them very carefully, you still are damaging and losing flowers. So I lose them in the field while picking. I lose them in the building while building bouquets. And I lose them in transport to the market, right? So when I add up the three ways that I destroy zinnias, it actually adds up to a lot of zinnias getting, getting lost. To, um, to damage due to them being such a, such a delicate stain. But so let's, let's just say like wholesale, I can sell, this is a zinnia, we're gonna pretend. Wholesale, I can sell this for a buck, right? But, and I can produce lots of them on my farm um, fairly easily, but there is a, a, like a handling cost to the zinnia. And then there's something like status. Right, so let's say wholesale, I can only sell this for 50 cents, right? Um, but the amount of time that it takes me to harvest the status is half the amount of time as to harvest the zinnia, and the, you know, and it actually produces a lot in the space, so I, I can get lots of stems off of it, and it grows really easily, the same as zinnias. The, the like, per, per stem labor value to dollar value um, is gonna be pretty comparable for these two things. And then if status can in fact, you know, be sold in large volumes very easily to florists, um, if it fits versatile, if, if it, status, like, you know, status is great. I'm never gonna get rid of status. Status, I can pick a week ahead of time. Status, if I don't sell it, there's no losses because when it doesn't sell, it dries and I can still sell it for the same price. When it's dried and it didn't sell, I can break it down, turn it into Christmas ornaments. I can, like, status is super, super valuable for me on the farm. Whereas zinnias, you know, they serve a purpose, they are well loved, but moving forward into future years, there might eventually come a point when we're growing less and less and less zinnias. We're, you know, I, I imagine there being a point in the future where we have like one bed of zinnias and it's for being able to, you know, in August and September, um, make a few zinnia recipes. Um, but yeah, so to go back this rant, <laughs> um, the question is like, what am I cutting out? Right. And so the reason why I'm talking about all this stuff is this is what I'm thinking about for cutting things out. Um, so um, I'm, I'm more so than thinking about cutting out at this point, because, um, you know, we're we're planning on planting in more perennials. And I say, Ian, I don't even know that we've talked about this much in live videos, but we're working like next year, I'm buying like 10 bets of perennials in. Like I have, I have three full beds of delphinium ordered. Um, I ordered 1200, um, 1200 sedums. Um, you know, we're, we're putting in all those um, peonies. So like the huge expansion that Ian was doing in the most recent video, like is, is gonna be peonies. But basically I think next year, I'm only going to have space for 30 annual beds plus um plus my my greenhouses i have two greenhouses and we're hoping to get a third one up um that i have on hand um before before the winter comes to have available for the spring so um 30 beds isn't isn't that much space especially when it's like okay well i'm not cutting back on status and so i have three beds of status planned for next year and you know i'm not gonna you know not going to completely not grow straw flowers. I had three beds of straw flowers this year. You know, maybe, maybe I'll have one bed of straw flowers this year, but you know, so there, like we already have four of my 30 beds filled, you know, zinnias, if two beds of zinnias, you know, having three beds to do rotations of, of sunflowers, um, you know, and that's kind of just summer, everything starts to fill up. So um, what I'm doing, at this point, because I am into like planning, I'm ordering in all my plugs like right now, and I'm ordering in these perennials, doing these big perennial orders right now. And so I'm forcing myself to think, okay, you're not gonna have that much space. 
Like what is the, what's the first priorities? What are the things that you want more <laughs> than, uh, than other things? And, um, you know, as, as I start making my list of like my top 10, you know, then it's going to get to a point where it's like, okay, do I want three beds each of my 10 favorites or do I want, you know, two beds each of my 10 favorites? And then what are the other 10 that make the cut to fill that space? But it's, it's going to get tight. So when I was ordering in the plugs, um, I ordered, uh, like a couple beds of Lysianthus. I ordered in some status. There's like a crazy storm going on. There's like lightning everywhere. We don't get like, we don't get thunder lightning storms very often. So it's kind of what? <laughs> It's like, oh, rain. Yay. I live in the desert and it's raining. This is amazing. Um, yeah. So the, I ordered in status. Um, I started to have to be like, okay, my greenhouse space. I only have two greenhouses at this point. If one, I'm going to have a bed of tulips and I'm going to be planting Lysianthus in like mid March, right? And that, that's going to be a full greenhouse filled. I'm going to have you know, two beds of ranunculus and two beds of anemones, right? That's going to be a greenhouse filled. Um, so then I started to have to be like, well, like, you know, snapdragons, do, am I going to grow them myself? And I'm going to order them in, um, stock. I ordered a tray, two trays of stock, which is a full bed. Um, so it's like, I don't know, like it really should be in the greenhouse to do well. We'll have to see. Um, but as, as I started working through things, um, I wanted to grow trochellium again. It was a total crop failure for me this year, but it was really beautiful. Um, and I suck at growing. So I'm like, yeah, you know, I just need to do it a few times to figure out how to do it properly. And every time I grow something, like I do, like I always grow it better the following year. So I was like, yeah, I think I figured it out enough that I'd be able to get something for next year and then i'll probably have to grow it one more time before i can get like good quality stems off of it um but when i started to be like okay i'm like do am i gonna have space for experimenting with a full bed um so i didn't order that in um and then like i'm pro so i had three beds of zinnia or yeah three beds of zinnias or did i have four beds of zinnias so i'm definitely gonna have less zinnias um, Cosmos, I had three beds of Cosmos, but I think I'm going to actually, even though I hate Cosmos and they drive me crazy, I think I'm still going to go heavy on Cosmos. I grew Apricotta this year for the first time. Um, and they, I love the, with the fall weather, they, they were like a really pretty pink all season, but with the fall weather and the shorter daylight hours, they've gone like this incredible, like strawberry lemonade color, like they're pink on the back and yellow in the middle. Um, you know, and it's like, oh, they're so cute, right? Like that with like the apricot status. You know, they, we want to do more florist sales next year. The plan is to, you know, try to get volumes of stuff. Um, so yeah, so stuff, stuff's going to start getting cut back. Less, less Brubeckia is probably going to happen. Um, more, more greeneries, more fillers. Um, because that I think is something that we have, you know, have an opportunity to kind of do wholesale um, because other flower farmers aren't necessarily doing it. Um, that's a few more lilies to fill in holes. Um, we're going to do glads in the crates again. We really like glads in the crates. Yeah, I'm just, I'm like mentally, I'm like walking up the field in my mind. Um, you know, spring, I, I honestly, I planted probably 20 beds for spring and very few of them like did anything. So I had a spring without like cold hardy annuals basically. And I was pretty amazed how easily I was able to get by because of the, um, with how many, how many um, perennials I have at this point. So, you know, where a fever few and yarrow are a huge priority for me. So I'm not gonna take away beds from fever few and yarrow. Um, especially cause I think that it could, it like, you know, like I said, the STEM math, right? Like the, those things, they all are good profitable crops for me. Um, but you know, maybe, maybe I'm going to start cutting back on, you know, the, having a half bed of this and a half bed of that, um, for spring, you know, stuff like, um, the, like 
nigella and uh you know scabiosa like i'm no interest in annual scabiosa but you know having like the perennial scabiosa in there um i just i need to bring my labor down so you know i'm, I'm really i'm crop planning for varieties with labor hours in mind um you know even before space so i know that doesn't necessarily answer the question um but you know what i'm not going to grow isn't necessarily super helpful because i'm sure most of you guys aren't like putting in a fourth bed of euro and and investing into 1200 1200 sedums um for the upcoming growing season um because you know i just i live in a weird place um, oh, here, one that failed, but I definitely wanted to try it again, is um, Safflower Carthamus. Um, so, I de like, I definitely want to do that again. I'm excited to get that to try. Um, are there any profitable, cool flowers that you can put in the ground in Zone 5, your area? Um, I'm assuming you mean, like, now, any anything that overwinters. Um, so, my favorite resource for Zone 5 um overwintering annuals is if you go and check out Johnny seeds they have a bunch of resources their zone five they're you know really similar winter winter weather to me um and they have a whole series of educational videos um about how they were able to overwinter a bunch of stuff really successfully and what it looked like they like they kind of did like greenhouse tours a few times through the spring in these videos talking about what different stuff looks like um and and so they're really valuable but the one thing about those videos for direct translation to me and probably to you is um that's like a proper high tunnel that's like a double walled um like insulated <clears throat> um tunnel right like two layers of plastic instead of the one um so the winter the amount of warmth protection that those tunnels do is is a lot more than anything that I get with my really simple tunnels. My tunnels don't necessarily freeze any less hard. Um, and then because like I'm a desert, so it's I like the, the tunnels are a little problematic for me because um, it's not like I get any benefit from them sheltering like rain and snow out. Um, I actually run into issues with the tunnels with, they get too dry for me to overwinter, but then I don't have water over the winter because our farm irrigation doesn't get turned on until like mid April. Um, so, um, so for me, for overwintering, I'm, I'm not really doing any, but I have overwintered stuff and the stuff that I've overwintered really successfully is anything that's perennial. So like, like, uh, the fever few yarrow uh rubecchia like all those types types of things if you fall plant um they bloom earlier and they like bloom a lot more abundantly than if you plant it in the spring um but at the same but i i don't at this point the way i manage those crops is they're not like in a tunnel or anything and i'm not planting fresh um plants every fall um because they're like they're semi-perennial for me um, I plant in the spring and, and I have permanent beds. I have like a full bed of feverfew, um, a full bed of rubecchia. And then over the course of the winter, about 50% of the bed will die. And so the plants that survive come back and they do that kind of overwintering type thing. And then the plants that die, I come through in the spring, like in April, and I pull the dead plants out and I plant brand new seedlings in and so by doing that um it's it's this amazing system and and i'm planning on putting um using this system for the fama scabiosa right because they kind of like they die out a little bit every year i'm planning on using this system for delphinium like any of these like short-lived perennials um i want to have as permanent beds that have me constantly restocking so that they like are like constantly aging in and out the plants but so when i do that the benefit of it over just like having a full bed that survived is that the stuff that overwinters blooms earlier and then i get like a stagger 
on it, right? Because it, I pick it all or it dies. And then the seedlings that I planted in the spring, when that all kind of finishes, then they start blooming. So by replanting the bed for winter kill, I'm able to get a longer harvest window while still um, keeping those like individual crops contained. Yeah. So like it's it's been a system that's that's worked really well. I forget what was the question. Okay, overwintering zone five. Um, yeah. So snapdragons, snapdragons. Um, I've had luck with rocket overwintering in in my like you know in my tunnel um uncovered no it, it still needed some sheltering um but yeah rocket did but i've never had any luck with um with my earliest blooming snapdragons like um brain farting costa so costa is really early blooming and then chantilly um, those are my two earliest blooming snapdragons, and I they I find are a lot more um, sensitive to freeze than some of the summer blooming varieties, right? So, um, so if if I could, rocket isn't at this point, I don't grow rocket snapdragons anymore, even though it is incredibly cold hardy, um, and like. So instead of overwintering, I just, I plant early. And then, um, you know, once I'm past the hard freeze, um, and for me, like the wind to plant cold hardy annuals in my tunnels is once we're not freezing anymore. So once like kind of nighttime lows are in around like zero Celsius, um, because when things are regularly zero Celsius, they will dip to minus five. And so a lot of these cold hardy annuals um, in a tunnel, and, and you know, this is stuff like Lysianthus too, stalks, snapdragons, um, all of those cold hardy annuals, I find that um, they can handle a night of freezing, but they can't necessarily handle, um, you know, like a week of hard freeze. Right? They can handle a week of like zero, but it, you know, and then, oh, oops, it went down to minus three. Um, and they'll like, they'll have some damage, but then they'll bounce back. Um, but yeah, so you, you need to be into those, the point of time when not a lot of really hard freezes are still happening before you plant them. Um, but yeah, I just, I mostly do all that stuff in spring. Um, but um, I am going to experiment this year for overwintering um, with Bells of Ireland in the tunnel because um, I'm trying. So I found this podcast and it's like amazing. It's like a flower farming podcast that is like, I'm like, where was this years ago? This is like such a great one. I'm like, I need to tell everyone about it. Um, but the problem, the reason why I never found it is the title of it um has n nothing to do with with flower farming so if you, if you like search flower farming um in like a podcast program it wouldn't show up um the guy's name is drew and i feel like i feel like it's name the name of it is like between me and drew or something but i don't know if that's like me just thinking of that like between two ferns like comedy show but like, yeah, Drew, Google Drew Flower Farming Podcast. You guys should all check this out. It's amazing. He's like, awesome. He's like actually like giving good business advice. You know, it's, he's like clear and concise and giving good business advice instead of rambling about like mediocre business advice like me. Um, so go check it out. Um, but he said that he, and he's zone five, he, or, well, no, now that I think of it, maybe he's not. Maybe I'm being too ambitious on this. But anyways, he said that he plants, he directs seeds, Bells of Ireland, into his tunnel, and that they bloom and are filler for him to go along with tulips. And I was like, what? That is incredible. That is, like, amazing. He said that they, because, so the thing I learned last year about Bells of Ireland is they to get good germination, you want cold stratification. So if you plant them in the winter and let them freeze outside, um, then when you go to germinate them, it, they'll be really easy to germinate. Um, because I tried growing them previously and I couldn't get any germination on them. Um, 
And other people have said, oh, yeah, they're weeds. Once you grow them once, they're just, they're everywhere. And so it's like, okay, yeah, cold stratification. Um, but yeah, but he was saying that like, they don't, they don't sprout. It's not like, oh, they, you grow them in the fall and then they overwinter. He said that they like, they go through the cold period and then they sprout and they grow really fast. So I don't think I'm going to be getting Bells of Ireland with my tulips, but if I could get Bells of Ireland with my ranunculus, that would be amazing. So I am going to reserve um, a section of one of my green, my, my tunnels for, for seeding in some Bells of Ireland and give that, give that an experiment. Because, um, yeah, if I could get those really early. Okay, let's see. What about dried pressed flower guards? Yes. Oh, thanks. Thanks so much, Kelly. That's so generous. Um, so we did, we wanted to do dried pressed flower carts this year. The plan was to build a large flower press for Leah, because Leah didn't want to like draw the cards anymore. She got bored of it. But the plan was to build her a flower press and then she could press all the flowers that she wanted so that she could make dried flower cards for the stand because um, she, she expressed interest in that. But she never, she never was like, okay, I'm ready to press flowers. Um, and the season just got so busy that it kind of went by the wayside. And so I think, you know, it's been like over a year since we've had cards in the roadside stand. Um, and so I'm like, I want cards, right? Because they are a really good add on. It's like, even like, even without it being um, a, about making money in the stand, because Leah's cards never were about making money. She, you know, she sold them like two for five dollars, right? They, they, she'd spend like an hour drawing them, and the card itself cost a dollar. Um, but um, yeah, so I, I want to get some cards that go in the stand just so that they're there, right? Because a lot of the bouquets get bought as as um, presents. And so, you know, like you want to have the card to go along with, with the flowers. So I want, I want to get cards back into the stand as like a service to our customers. Um, but so I think the plan is that we're, we're going to go through like, cause we have, we have lots of pictures that are really attractive of the flowers and we'll, we'll print out, we'll print like a hundred cards with a picture, you know, we'll, we'll do a run of like 500 cards and then we'll, um, we'll just have them for this, you know, they can, they can five bucks in the stand, you know, we'll have like five years worth of, <laughs> worth of like cards, blank cards for people to buy. Um, you know, and if we want, we can print a few, like, oh, a new design every year. I don't know. Maybe one of these days we, um, one, we have considered maybe getting into paper goods. So stuff like cards and calendars, um, and doing like, we, we keep talking to Leah about like making Christmas cards, um, to have like a card set that we could then sell for online sales. Um, but it just hasn't happened because the, on, like the shipping involved in doing online sales is, it's just a lot of work. Um, you know, it take like a day, <laughs> a week of shipping stuff. And we just, we haven't been at the point where we have an extra day every week um at any point in the business so you know going into next year like those those are the type of things we might look into more um if we're scaling back on farmers markets you know because if we're we're not doing a farmers market then we got a day right so um but yeah i like i i would like to make do some pressed flowers not even so much like because they would be a profitable product um but just i think that it would be like a fun craft for family uh, I think about you achieving this year with blown out tulips and sweltering ranunculus. I know the, I need to have, I need every year I need to plant for if the weather's hot and also for if the weather's cold so that I can have at least one, one good quality harvest. Well, thanks so much, Lisa. Uh, thank you for sharing your holiday. So much good news tonight. I know I was really excited. I like, I, I couldn't believe, I couldn't believe how well, the weekend went and then to actually like look at those numbers and, to, and then hanging out with you guys it definitely it feels like a celebration let's see interesting concept make us seeing the market aspect of the equation from a market bouquet perspective customers may not want to pay the same price for fewer stamps well okay so like yeah and and this this is a good point right um so they're 
the trick is right like so wait i'm like where's my scabby upset right like so everything has a price right like it's um it's not like i'm saying that it's not like i'm saying oh i'm gonna i'm gonna put less value into the bouquets the bouquets are 18 dollars plus tax right so the bouquets get 18 dollars worth of stamps and so i'm like this is a great way of illustrating because because this is the thing and like i have a video like the like i have a video that i've been like percolating on that i'm gonna make about um perceived value versus versus like act like flower value and how perceived value is as important as as the cost of the flowers um and so the trick in making a bouquet recipe is to find a way that the perceived value is the same as your actual cost right you could so here's here's the example um okay here yeah okay so i'm gonna hold are you ready for it guys i'm gonna hold up a 60 dollar bouquet right and like if i'm honest this might actually be an 80 dollar bouquet right but if i brought this down to the farmer's market um priced at 80 dollars like no one's gonna buy this right so it doesn't it doesn't matter that the per stem is is very low right because i'm only using this it doesn't it do, isn't going to have the perceived value that matches its actual value but this is hugely value for me to add like one like one or two like little wispy pieces into a bouquet i do that and it really elevates the bouquet um but on their own this you know this isn't very valuable you know another example is here here we go Here's a $20 bouquet. Here's a $20 bouquet. No one, I mean, I, I could actually sell these, right? I could, I could probably sell some $20 status bunches, but if I went down to my farmer's market with a hundred, a $120 status bunches, my total sales for the day is, is not going to be great. There's only going to be a few people who want to get, a bunch a twenty dollar bunch of status right but in my bouquet recipes um i throw three status on there right and you know and now the status like you know looks hugely valuable i don't know i don't have enough flowers up here to throw together a bouquet um so when when i say that my goal is to find ways of bringing down the average stem per bouquet um you know what i'm saying is that here's like here's a great example um you know this this is a single stem right so this this isn't like no one's gonna be bummed that this is in the bouquet right um you know like this this is very desirable to customers because because it's quite large but um you know and then just grab a couple more props here you know this this is a really good way of illustrating okay so this this it's so big i can't even show you guys this is a single stem right so this is one stem of nice hyssop right and this is also one stem of anise hyssa right and so when i say that what i'm working on is having is having less stems in the bouquet um when i'm saying hey i want i want to put in a stem that costs three dollars instead of a stem that costs a buck right like th this is a buck right and this and then let's say this is three dollars right but if you actually look at the value that the customer is getting right like this at a buck 
is, you know, like this looks like six dollars. Like you'd have to have six of these to have the same amount as this. So for the customer, even though these are both single stems, if I sold them this at three dollars, they feel like it's half price, right? But labor for me in the field, right? Like to clean this stem and to clean this stem, completely same labor, to cut the stem, to cut the stem, completely same labor in bouquet making to lay out one stem, completely same labor, right? This to lay out three of these to equal $3, you know, one, two, three, you know, like there's three, right? right? Um, three times as much labor, three stems to cut, three times as much labor, three stems to clean, three times as much labor. Um, the only difference between these um, is like, sure, maybe I can only grow like one of like two of these per square foot or okay, let's let me actually give a real number this. I can get six of these per square foot and of these little ones, I could, I could probably get like 50 of these per square foot. So if these are a buck, you know, at at um at like so fifty dollars per square foot these are three dollars and i get six of them you know i'm only able to grow half the amount of dollars per square foot but when you factor in the 50 stems the labor of 50 stems versus the labor of six stems um then even though i get more volume the and like per dollar per square foot the labor savings make it so that this is actually better for not only me, but also for the customer. So like, I, I understand, like you make a great point, right? If, if what I used to make was a bouquet that had 18 of these in them, if I used to accidentally undercharge um, for my stems and now all of a sudden I want to charge what they're actually worth, then the customers would be like, well, why, why do I want that? But if, if what I'm just doing is, is providing these like big, bigger, more beautiful stems. So the bouquets are bigger and more beautiful. That's the perceived value. The perceived value is very high. And then the, the labor is just a little bit lower for me so that I can actually get to profitable because you know, I'm, I'm not going to be able to, I'm not going to ever be able to pay myself minimum wage, um, selling, selling these like dinky little stems in retail. Bouquets. It's just, it's too expensive. So, um, yeah, I hope, I hope that clarifies things a little bit because I'm sure you're not the only one who is, who is wondering about that. Okay. Here, I get this all the time. Have you ever considered to grow roses? Um, so no, I will never grow roses. The only, and I, I shouldn't say never because there is a place where I would grow roses. So I would like to eventually get to the point now that we're like into the year five to 10 <laughs> plan, um, starting next year, um, we're onto like the year 10 plan instead of the year five plan. Um, in my plan is I would like to eventually get some landscaping on our property. Um, I'd like to do some like beautification projects. Um, and so the, I would put roses into landscaping. Um, especially like, you know, big rambling rows, like they're, they're, they're really beautiful. Um, the reason why I would never put them into the farm is where we live, like roses don't like it here. <laughs> like we're cold, right? So roses, like, roses aren't necessarily like the, they're not going to die, right? Like roses are perennials here. They're shrubs here. They're, they like, I'm not going to have a problem growing roses, but there will be winters that are cold enough that like it would kill roses here in the Okanagan. Um, so the cold isn't ideal for them. And then at the same time, my summers are also not ideal for them. We're very hot and we're very dry and it really stresses out the roses. So they just, they're not super healthy. And so because roses in the Okanagan are not super healthy, um, they end up being weaker plants and then they get attacked by aphids. So any row, like I'm like, I can walk past a wild rose bush in like 
in, in the ditch, it's covered in aphids. I can walk past someone's beautiful garden and the rose is covered in aphids. Um, they're not only are, would I never be able to pick roses because they'd be so buggy because we, we do, we don't use pesticides. Um, but they also would bring aphids onto our farm, which would then have the potential to spread to other crops. Um, so because of that, like we're, roses aren't, roses aren't going to happen. We don't, no roses, only lisianthus. They look like roses, but um, they're, they're going to be a little bit happier for us. Um, how is solidago and water and also dried? So I don't like solidago dried. I'm like, I had some that I picked last week that I didn't use and they dried out in the bucket, but they're gone. Um, solidago when it dries, it looks, it looks kind of ratty. And so I don't, I don't know if you dried it earlier, if it, if it would dry more attractive. Um, I'll use it occasionally, but it doesn't look as good as I thought it would look. I, I thought it would have really good potential for dried. Um, and then it has really good vase life. But I will say this. So um, I don't, when I talk about like, oh, I'm foraging, um, like that's just me, like I'm picking out of my farm beds. I don't actually do, the only foraging I do is the, is this one shrub that grows like right beside the farm um, in, in this like empty property. And the reason why I'm comfortable with using that is because I actually water it. <laughs> I like in the, I irrigate it like throughout the summer because I'm like, okay, I'm going to want to use that. And when I'm harvesting it, I'll like irrigate it um, in anticipation to harvesting it. But where I am, we're so dry that um, e even if there was like solidago like growing in the ditches around us, um, because there are things like yarrow, like yarrow actually does, does grow here wild. Um, but if I went to harvest yarrow off the side of the road, I wouldn't be able to use it in my bouquets, um, because it's so dry here that the lack of, of moisture means that those like wild plants that, that you can forage for, for me, um, have really, really bad base life. So even though it's the exact same plant as grown in my farm, the vase life on forage stuff is going to be like a third of what my actual like cultivated crops are. So for me, I would never, and yet again, right? Like this is a, this is an Okanagan. This is like a <laughs> desert problem. Um, for me, I would never go foraging for solid ego because the vase life would be really bad. Um, but the vase life of the solid ego that I grow in my farm is great. The vase life of the solid ego is like two weeks. It's, it's really, it's a really strong, um, if, and if you pick it at the right stage, you're supposed to pick it before it opens to get like the longest vase life out of it. Um, but so, okay, let's see, can I, yeah, yeah, I'm laughing, Jennifer. We know she isn't cutting marigolds. Okay, so this is my marigold story that I was that I was telling Ian. Um, oh, and then people are asking about toxic lilies, so I'll answer that. Um, so on on Saturday, I did this market. It's it's at this like great farm just down the road from us that me and the kids we love to go visit. They do they're a you pick orchard, so it's like you pick fruit. Um, it's just, it's very family friendly and they did the market last year. And, and so my kids, they, it was like so fun for them. There's like music and crafts and like, you know, all their farm friends in the area are there. Um, and it was very, it was very low key. Um, so we, we did it again this year. And one of the great things about it is like, I'm never at markets, right? And like, especially we're never at a market like near us. So there's so many people that, you know, buy from us all the time at the roadside stand. Like, I know we have regulars because I recognize the same emails for e-transfers in our email box. Um, but I don't necessarily know who these people are because it's self-serve, right? Um, so it, it's really nice to get to be at that market and talk to like some of our regular customers, you know, and, and like 
you know, say thank you for all the support and, you know, get to put names, faces and all that. Um, but like every single person who was like, oh, I buy from you guys all the time at, at the market, you know, there was like four or five people who were like, oh yeah, I buy all the time. They're like those. And I had all the marigolds there because I was putting together bouquets. Like I was like, okay, <laughs> putting them together and then just selling them because I'd sent everything I made all the night before down to the market. Um, but they're all like, oh, I love your bouquets. They're like, whatever this is, I just love it. It lasts forever. Your bouquets, they're like, they're such great value because the vase life is so great on them. And like, oh, I just like love how big and bright and fun they are. Um, so it was like the one flower that the people who bought all the time from us, like came back. Right. So like looking at it on the table, there was no like new customers coming by and being like marigolds, my favorite. This is my favorite thing out of everything on the table. And, you know, fair enough. I use marigolds as a filler. The marigolds are not they're not like even I don't even treat them as a flower. I, I treat them as like an orange and yellow, uh, like greenery, basically. Um, but all those people who were regular customers were saying that the the value that they got out of the marigolds was it, it was the thing that after having enjoyed a few bouquets they like came and said to me when they could have said anything right um so like and and no one knows no one knows their marigolds right so they're they're really they they grow really well for me um you know they're they're they just go and they go and they're bright and beautiful and they're big and they're lush and like the customers love them. Um, so yes, marigolds. And, but, and like, I, I'm like, oh, we're never going back now that I have like, so I bought my marigold seeds from Bull um, and the varieties that I did this year were cocoa in the yellow, gold and orange. And then I also bought uh, Zoshi, I think is how it's pronounced. X O C H I. Um, and like, it was gorgeous. The, the Zoshi and it's, it was like, people are like, this is the best marigold ever, but it's only in like the bright orange and like the best is cocoa gold, right? If you're only going to grow one cocoa gold, that is like the magic. Um, but the Zoshi, um, I liked it better than cocoa orange. Um, but they, they kind of successioned well because the first flush on Zoshi was first and then <coughs> Coco Orange flushed. And then the first flush, there's always a bit of a lull before you get the second round because the first, um, here, let's use this. Marigolds, the way it's hard to tell because they're just like insanely big. Um, so you can't really see it in the videos, but they kind of grow like, like the shape of this and these hiss up. So the first Marigold is like the center stem and I cut the center stem out, right? And then and then it takes a little while for the side branches to bloom. Um, but the reason why they're so productive is, you know, after you cut out that center, the first cut, um, you know, each, each of those marigolds had like 12, 14, 16 side branches. Like they just like went and went and went and they kind of bloom down on the plant. Um, so the Zoshi had the center stem to bloom first, picked that out, and then Coco Gold, Coco Orange bloomed when I didn't have any of the Zoshi, um, and then the Zoshi started blooming, um, and they both, both Coco Orange and Zoshi, like super, super strong till end of season, same as like the gold and the yellow, um, just great, great, amazing, amazing marigolds. Okay, uh, lilies being toxic to cats. Um, so like people, people bring this up all the time. Um, and like, so when, so what is toxic to cats in the lilies is the pollen. Um, so when you get lilies from a florist, if the flower is open, the florists are actually gonna take the, the pollen stems off. Um, because if they drop, they, they stain the flowers and, and they'll stain your table and stuff. So a florist isn't going to send out lilies um, with pollen um, available on them. Um, and then uh, 
as your lilies open, you can you can take that pollen off too, right? So if if you um, if you have cats and you, but you like lilies and you want them in your house and you're really worried about your cats in your house getting into them, um, you know that's something to consider, right? Um, my cats, they're like my cats aren't sticking their faces in my flowers. The only thing the cats ever go after in my flowers is when when I do grasses. <laughs> Right. If I like have a grass in there and then it has like the grass stems, then my cats will come and they'll try to eat the grass out of the bouquets. Um, but, you know, so I like I feel completely comfortable selling lilies. You can buy them anywhere. Right. Like every grocery store has like lily bouquets. There's no like warning on them about animals. And it's like it's really commonly known. And then for like in the farm, um, you know, like I always I like I think. Cause, and I understand, right? Like I love cats. I don't want cats to be dying. Um, but when, like sometimes when I hear people like talk like online and I'm not like, I'm not talking about the audience, but I've like, I've, you know, seen like shorts where someone's like, oh my God. And they're like freaking out. Did you know, like lilies are going to kill your cats. And you know, and fair enough, that's what you do. Like when you're on the internet, you're like, ah, like crazy person. But I see, like, I see videos of people being like, ah, poison for cats and then and then I always think like the the Wizard of Oz movie and when they're like all like passed out in the in the poppy field and and I just I'm like I'm always like I don't know I've never seen like just a field full of like dead cats around like you know it's not like oh there's lilies and then there's just like like cats like passed out in the lilies around them um you know I've never, like, my cats will walk through the lilies, but the pollen is, like, up on, high up on the plant. Um, so they're never, they're never getting into the lily pollen. Um, and, and I've never seen a cat, like, actively go after lilies. And, and also, they're everywhere, right? Like, you know, they're such a common landscaping plant. Like, obviously, it happens that, that cats get poisoned by it. But I, I, I don't think the risk is as high as maybe you know i'm more worried about making sure or that there's no like antifreeze leaks um in in any of my vehicles when it comes to like cat safety than i am about like lilies being toxic to cats um but i also we're a farm right like we're we're a farm like there's there's um there's dangerous things that happen on farms right like we're not we, there is an element of risk in in what we do um and so we we do have stuff that's like dangerous to people too we like i don't sell edible flowers <laughs> the bouquets aren't for eating um and you know some of some of the flowers are poisonous some of the flowers you know have risks associated with handling them you know we use knives and and uh and you know, like sharp tools, um, you know. So there, there's an element of risk that I'm comfortable with with being a business. And I understand that if it was me, you know, I maybe wouldn't be taking those same risks if it was like a home garden. So you know, like I understand, like you know, people people wanting people to know that um, lilies can can poison cats. Um, yeah, someone else. My lilies have never been into chomping lily. My kitties have never been to chomping lilies. Oh, cardoon! There! Something something I'm not going to grow again. I love the cardoon. It was beautiful. Um, but I can't afford. I can't afford to grow cardoon. Um, here, uh, crop rotations. That's a good question. Do I do, do... Do I rotate flowers to different beds each year? Um, no. Because my live video is like, hey, Serena, it's been two hours. We, you should probably shut down. It's too much. Um, yeah, so I don't, I don't rotate crops. Um, I grow a mix of stuff. So I'm not especially concerned. Um, it's not like I'm growing the same thing over and over again. The one thing though that I do do, um, which is what is basically the idea of rotating crops, Growing the same thing over and over again can allow for the buildup of like pest pressure 
um, that overwinters. And, you know, being in Canada, we get a little bit less pest pressure than other places because less pests can overwinter successfully. Um, having cold winters helps us out for, you know, pest management. Um, but if I have crops that are starting to have issues, um, like, oh, there's too much, like it's susceptible to this fungal disease that we have on the farm, um, instead of still trying to grow it and like just rotating it to a different part of the property because like an acre is tiny, right? Like it's, you know, so it's like, it's like pests. If I, if I moved my plants three beds over, um, you know, like the, the bugs are still going to find it. It's <laughs> like, you know, my property size is so small that some of these like rotational things, um, they're just, even if I did rotate it, it wouldn't do what they're supposed to do. Um, but yeah, so the, um, if I start having disease or pest issues with specific crops, I'll just stop growing it, <clears throat> you know, and I'll, I'll do, I'll basically do like crop rotations, right? So I grow some Ami now, which is part of the carrot family, but, um, we had so many carrot rust fly issues, um, from, and we never did grow carrots in the same bed over and over again, right? We, we were rotating that crop, but over the years, over the course of like the three years of growing vegetables, um, we got such a carrot rust fly infestation that at this point I'm like, okay, it needs to be like two or three years before we'll grow carrots again. And, <clears throat> you know, I'm not necessarily helping because Amy is part of the carrot family. So it is, um, Carrot rust fly is still probably surviving in our farm on the ami, um, but because the amount of ami that I grow is, you know, like half a bed versus, you know, five beds of carrots, like what we did when we did veggies, um, you know, it's, it's more manageable. Um, but yeah, so I like, I do recognize that um, growing certain crops again and again can, can affect how they grow. And so, you know, my, my goal is just to make everything as easy as possible on the farm, right? So if there's something and I grow it and we have too many bugs on it, then, you know, obviously I'm not going to do it. Hey, are you going to grow eucalyptus again? Um, so I am convinced and all my flower farmer friends are like, no, Serena, you don't know what you're talking about. Um, but they haven't convinced me. Um, but I am convinced that no one in North America, unless you're in a place where eucalyptus it, like Southern, Southern America, Southern United States. Um, I'm convinced no one is making money on eucalyptus. I think that eucalyptus is so difficult to grow and the amount that you get from like an annual crop of eucalyptus versus the price that you can charge for it. Um, because it's like, it's, it's like Australian willow trees, right? They grow like crazy. Um, so it's, it's cheap for them to sell it when they have like an entire like 50 foot tree of it. Um, so for us to compete with that price wise, um, it's just, you know, it's, it's, I, I don't, I think it's too much work for, for what you get out of it. So I will never be like a commercial eucalyptus farm is what I'm saying. But, and, I'm, and I wanted to say that first because I'm, I'm buying in a case of eucalyptus. I, I ordered in, it's, it's coming to me in mid-February. Um, I have 800 eucalyptus <laughs> plugs coming. Um, and, and I'm gonna, like, I'm gonna try to sell off a bunch of them because as I said, all my, all my local flower farmer friends, they, they still think that eucalyptus is great. They're like, oh, eucalyptus. Um, so I'm like, hey, you wanna like, buy a hundred, want to buy a hundred plugs so that I can afford to get this whole case in. Um, we're going to do a seedling sale for next year. We're going to grow, we're going to sell seedlings all year long. Um, and like one of my ways that I'm going to bring, bring in the people, um, is by having a, like a few things that they can't find anywhere else. Um, so I want eucalyptus, not because I'm going to plant it on the farm, though I'll probably be like, I got it. I might as well plant a couple, but I'm not like, I'm not going to give an, like I said, I have 30 beds. There's, there's no room 
in like 30 beds to do a bed of eucalyptus. Um, but, but yeah, so I'm going to grow out eucalyptus plugs, try to get them as big as possible and then sell them, you know, in like a four inch pot for a seedling sale. So then when everyone is like, oh my God, I love eucalyptus. I can be like, I have it. Come buy it from me. Um, so technically I'm growing eucalyptus next year. Um, but I'm not, um, do you notice a favored flower difference between farmers, market customers and the roadside stand customers? Are they pretty equivalent? Um, yeah, no, this year in past years, it's been pretty much the same, but this year, what people bought at the roadside stand versus what people were buying down at the farmer's market was like totally different. Um, so like our, like people at the farmer's market just love like Zowie zinnias. And so, you know, like I have this bouquet recipe that's like my Zowie zinnia recipe and it like, it sells like crazy. Um, and it, and it does still down at the farmer's market. It, Ian's like, oh yeah, first one to sell at the roadside stand. I can't sell a single one of them. I put them, you know, <laughs> it'll be like every week I'll be like, oh, should I even bother? Like if I send this to the, like if I send this to the farmer's market, it'll sell. Um, it's nice to be able to have like a variety of different looks in the roadside stand. But I'm like, I know if I put it in here, like it's, it's not going to sell. I'm going to end up, you know, like pulling this out unsold. Um, yeah, so that was really surprising. And then this year at the stand, 50% of what was selling <clears throat> in August and September was a rainbow bouquet that I, that I was doing that had four mixed zinnias, um, like an anise hyssop, um, and then, uh, blue status and white zinnia or white cosmos. All right, so it was like, big. oh, and, and then a yellow and an orange, because that's like my filler, a yellow and an orange um, marigold. So that was like number one set, like I sold like hundreds of them at the roadside stand. But that, when it would go down to the farmer's market, was always like the last to sell. Ian would regularly bring back um, that specific bouquet recipe which I was like, okay, perfect. Like it'll sell, it'll sell in the roadside stands. So I don't, I don't mind that that one didn't sell. But yeah, in past years, the customers had been like more like exactly the same. And then this year was the first year that I noticed a bit of a difference. So, you know, I, I thought that was interesting. I mean, like it's only those two bouquets that really like, you know, for the rest of it, um, it was, it was pretty much the same. But I will say this um, from year to year, like trend, like color trends and stuff change. So um, a lot of the recipes that I have are, um, are fairly like simple. Um, they're kind of like, more, like my rainbow bouquet is like really timeless. Um, but I remember like, cause, oh, how many years ago was it that like yellow was um, like a color of the year, like a Pantone, Pantone or whatever it's called, um, color of the year. And that year, like for that year and the year following, like yellow flowers, like just sold like crazy. Everyone really, really liked yellow. Um, and then that fizzled out. And then I've also been noticing that like the boho, um, you know, it, when I send stuff last year, the, the boho stuff started to be like, eh, like it, it wasn't as strong of a seller. And this year, like the boho is, is very much like, you know, I think that a lot of like our boho fresh flower customers got converted into like dried, dried flower customers. Um, because that boho look in dried still like flies really fast. Um, and then I put my money on 2022 pink being like the color of the year. Um, and pink has still, still been really strong. And I think that like with like, the trends coming from like the Barbie movie. I think like I'll safely, I'll safely say that like, yeah, if you like go, I think if you go pink next year, pretty much anywhere, I think we're, we're all going to be able to make a safe bet that people are going to be loving all shades of pink still um, next year. But I think one of the things that I do that makes it so my stuff is a little bit less um, trend sensitive is my goal is always 
to be making stark contrasts um, in in my bouquets. So, you know, like like here's like here's a Serena here's a Serena bouquet, right? So I'm like, oh, like orange. What's like the best possible color that you could put with orange, right? And it's this is my answer, right? I'm like, yeah, blue, blue and orange. I love it. Um, Whereas like a lot of other people would be like, first of all, this color is too saturated. They'll be ditch. <laughs> None of that. They'll be like gold. Has to be gold, <laughs> not bright orange. And then if they were, if they, you know, other people's designs would be like, oh, I have gold, and then I pair it with this, and then I'm like, where's that? I'm like, where's that pink? I'm like looking for the pink status. Yeah, and then they're gonna be like, oh, and then this in there and oh yeah, here we go and then oh i'm gonna finish it with you know the pink status and like this is the bouquet that someone you know other people would make right like this i don't i don't do this very often right i'm like okay none of this pink with this orange i'm doing like this with, with the orange and none of this soft right like this isn't the cosmo that i do it would be like white, right? Because white is going to contrast strongly against the blue and the orange. And then like, you know, basically I'm making the rainbow bouquet here. And then I wouldn't put in the peachy, um, the peachy, uh, peachy Cosmo or <laughs> Dahlia. I'd, I'd put in like a bright, a Barbie pink Zinnia. And like, that would be, that would be the rainbow bouquet. So I think because what I'm and then so I think when I do that it's like very like like oh startling to the eyes it's like the strong you know because it's like color theory right like you know blue and orange are on opposite sides of the color chart so because of that they like really contrast against each other and that strong contrast is like you know very attention grabbing um so when I design my bouquet recipes, I'm like, I'm going for that strong contrast, very, very eye catching, very like startling almost. Um, whereas like, you know, the, like what, that color palette that I put together there, that's like more like wedding work where it's like, it's softer, it's gentler, um, it's, it's less in your face. And that stuff is gorgeous, it's beautiful, like it, it looks very, very formal, very nice. Um, but on a table at, at a farmer's market, it's not necessarily going to get someone to like, you know, out of the corner of their eye, <laughs> get sucked in. Um, so I think that like some of, some of the bouquet recipe building that I do, um, because it's technically wrong, right? It's like like no one is like being like the way to design flowers properly is to like make them so startling that it burns your eyeballs it's like don't do that is is like the rules um so because it's like my bouquet recipes are so wrong they're right <laughs> basically and and then it gives it gives me a little bit of forgiveness because i'm not um i'm not you know doing what needs to be done Oh, Ian is in the here. He's like, I just did the math and we sold 545 from the stand today, which is crazy. That's like one of the best day. <laughs> one of the best days ever. That's exciting. Oh, apparently two at an hour ago, I was supposed to come according to Ian. Um, uh, Holly, no, Holly, Holly doesn't get <laughs> <yeah>, Leah. <laughs> um, Holly doesn't do Holly is, doesn't survive. Um, how do you deal with no water in your tunnel in the winter in your tunnel? So um, the building that I'm in, so our farm water is on a different water system and it gets turned on and off by our city. Um, it's only available to specific, like in the non-freeze time of year. So they turn it on in April and it's gonna get turned off really soon. Um, the building that I'm in, they ran the water line for this off of the house. So this building always has water um, and we have a faucet on this building. And so we have like a 200 foot hose <laughs> that we drag. Um, 
but because because it's so dry here um first of all like when when i plan for like okay where are the tunnel like the tulips the tulips are a perfect example so we did the raised bed tulips in a spot that's actually really close to the stand and, and or to this building and that was because we knew we were going to have to water tulips before the farm water was turned on so everything that that is going to need overwintering water has to be as close as possible to the building and then we also are limited for how much winter growing we could ever do because we have one faucet um so the the amount of space that we can irrigate um is going to be limited to just like how how much can you bump a hose <laughs> in a day um you know especially when it's like you, you kind of have to wait for a day when it's warm enough that you can run the hose and then you have to take down the hose because it's gonna freeze um overnight um so it's it it is really complicated so um we 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 very much limit <laughs> our our win our um early season growing um and then we drag a 250 foot hose all over the place okay i'm trying really hard to get through these things um but <laughs> yeah everyone's like ian's trying to message you but okay i don't know uh hydrangeas um so we do want to put some hydrangeas in <clears throat> the plan is along the fence line at the very bottom of the property oh thanks kelly you're putting in all these like re like resources for everyone for the marigolds um yeah so the the down at the very bottom of the property along the fence line we oh i made it to the bottom of the chat um down on the very bottom of the fence um we left a little bump buffer and then we're going to do um we're going to do a line of hydrangeas so i think our pro the width of our property is um about like 175 feet um maybe maybe 200 feet across so we'll do a single line of hydrangeas um and then then we'll like kind of hoard them um but the we're our space isn't big enough for us to want to invest into woodies you know our our entire property including like our house and like our driveway like everything is two and a half acres um the the actual growing space is only is only an acre um of of square footage and so you know it's just we're, we're limited we can't we can't do everything um which is good it's good to have limits um so you know when we started thinking about like oh what are things that we could grow that would be lower labor um you know i i said like no no woodies no no shrubs like we'll do peonies and and those are kind of like a permanent investment um and then and then we'll do perennials right and you know the great thing about perennials is they pay for themselves so quickly so if you change your mind and rip them out it's it doesn't feel that painful um whereas if i like spent years and got like some hydrangeas like established and then i decided ah you know like i don't actually want to do flowers um i'd be like Ooh, i'd be a bit sad about it so yeah so we'll do a row of them they'll be beautiful um it'll be a, like a little bit of a like visual line that'll be nice and you know that's that's enough we we can have them for like special events and we don't need to have a hydrangea in every bouquet every week for the entire farm season <clears throat> okay last question then i have to go can you can i grow my tulips in a raised garden bed also how often do you have to water your tulips once planted um so yeah and then someone else was asking if i'm gonna grow my tulips in crates so just i'll quickly go over like what i do with tulips um and and some just basics on tulips and then i have to go um so tulips need something called chill hours it means that they need like a certain amount of time where it's cold um so you know i'm sure there is a point at which tulips like start dying right so like with raised beds the one can the one risk with raised beds is because they're open on the sides um they 
Yeah. Here's where <laughs> or great, right? Because the cold air can get here as well as here, as well as here, as opposed to the ground, which is like, you know, only on the top. Um, they freeze deeper because it'll freeze down as well as in, right? So the one risk with raised beds is depending on where you are and how cold it gets and how much snow you get and all that, um, the raised beds can, can get a lot colder than in ground growing. Um, but for me, cause we, we use some raised beds, um, for the tulips. Like I'm, I'm not worried about that because we don't get so cold that it's going to like freeze and kill the tulips here. Um, but the tulips are a little tricky because, um, you, if you aren't cold enough in the winter, you actually will have problems. So tulips are great for Northern growers, but like Southern United States, tulips are actually like an annual. You have to like buy them and they come having like been in the fridge for like six months and then you plant them in the bloom and then they just kind of, they die. They never really come back. They never bloom again. Um, but, um, you know, so for me here, because we're so dry and for context, my snow melts, we get one week of wet um, and then a year, right? We have one week when it's like, oh, the fields are mucky. And that week happens because the snow melts, but the ground is still frozen. So because the ground is frozen, the snow that was like above the ground pools up. And then like within a week, the ground defrosts and then it's just the water's gone. It's just like it, for us, like, you know, I refer to the farm as the sand pit and it's like, there's no, there's no water retention at all on our property. Um, so if you're in an area that has lots of clay, um, then you might be running into issues of your tulip bulbs rotting because they're too wet, um, in the spring. Maybe you need, need raised beds cause you need, you need drainage. Um, so for me, um, we get, we, in Kelowna, we have snow, um, January, February, and then end of February, the snow usually melts. We're usually farm prepping by like the second week of March. I'm usually planting things. Um, and tulips kind of start blooming in April for me. So January, February, it's fine. It's great. Like they have snow on top of them that they're not, they're not bothered, but by March, um, they're for me because of where I live, because desert, um, they're going to, they're going to start to be really dry. So starting in March, I need to irrigate my tulips and it's because when they first start growing, they, they need a lot of water to get, to put on like good length. And like as a flower farmer, um, tulips are grown as an annual. You like plant them, you grow them out, you cut the bulb off and you throw the bulb in the garbage. So the, and the reason why we do that is to get as much stem length as possible. Um, but so, um, if, if I don't water and the stem length only ever gets like short, they can have these beautiful blooms. Um, but without giving them lots of water and like really keeping an eye on them when it comes to like the soil drying out in this like weird winter period of time, um, I can get stunted tulips, which really affects the profitability of the tulips for me. Um, so for me, like once a week, I'm watering the tulips in like March and April before they bloom. Um, and then this last year we had like a heat wave. It was insane. It was like the worst tulip, like it was like tulip disaster. Um, and so I was, I was like watering all the time because it was like impossible to, to keep them cool and well watered. Um, it was really challenging this last year, but you know, as I said, the me needing to water the tulips once a week starting in March um, is like a like my specific climate thing. Um, you might be in an area where you if you did that, you could be killing your tulips. Um, and then so the other question is about crates. And so so there's this thing that farmers like these crates I love. These are not, these are not bulb crates. These are, these are shipping crates and bulb crates are a little bit bigger, right? They're, they're like, a, they're big, a little bit 
they're like more like out here and more up here. Um, they probably like for actual volume, they're probably double what these are. They're like a little deeper, right? They're, they're quite large. Um, so they're called fall crates and farmers love them. They're the best thing in the entire world. Um, and where I'm from, like this feels like it's a Canada problem, but it's probably a population density problem. You, they're like, you can't buy fall crates in the Okanagan. Um, you know, the people, whoever is getting them, um, you know, is hoarding them. There's no, there's no, no bulb crates for sale. Um, so last year we, cause we get an entire pallet of tulips at this point. Um, my tulips came packed in bulb crates. We got, you know, 50 bulb crates or something. We're like, ah, it's amazing. We were really excited about our bulb crates. And, um, so Ian stole most of them and I was like, Hey, those are mine. Bring them back. Um, cause he organized his garage with them. And then I slowly stole them back for planting. I planted some tulips in them. Um, and then we, and I planted the glads in them throughout the summer. Um, so I don't like, you know, I had like 10, 15 of the bulb crates to work with cause Ian had taken the majority of them. And so what I'm really crossing my fingers on is that I get another pallet um, of bulb crates again this year. And then I can, you know, I'll have enough bulb crates that I'll be able to do an entire bed worth of bulb crates. I'll like take my entire pallet and I'll turn like I'll pack, I'll, I'll fill them back up to grow out, um, to grow out the tulips. And those tulips will be my like green my greenhouse over when like my greenhouse tulips because what I do is to get a succession bloom on my tulips and to get tu tulips a little bit earlier because if they bloom out over a longer if, if I get tulips blooming for eight weeks instead of tulips blooming for six weeks um then I can do less work per day right? There's still like a thousand hours of tulip harvesting to do, but it's easier to do it over six or eight weeks than it is to do over six weeks. Um, so by putting, um, a, a bed worth of, uh, worth of the, worth of the tulips inside of a greenhouse, it gets them to bloom two weeks earlier than my, than my field tulips. So by doing that, yeah, but so my plan is fingers crossed because my greenhouse that I had the tulips in last year, which had the raised bed in it, um, is the, is the greenhouse that got taken out by the tornado. Um, and he, we're not going to put that a greenhouse back up in that spot because that spot is, um, it like, it has this like weird weather pocket where, you know, we can put up another greenhouse and then like another tornado is going to like whip through there and tear it down again. So that can be field. <laughs> um, and we're going to put, we have, and we have a greenhouse on hand. We have a spare one. So we're going to put it up closer, closer to the building, which is also good for watering. Um, and then instead of having to like, drag up that that raised bed it can just keep living there and then we can use the bulb crates um in there but and i i want to do maybe some experimenting with growing um ranunculus inside bulb crates this spring too um but we'll we'll see i like i really like them for the glads growing the glads in the bulb crates amazing Glow, growing the tulips in the bulb crates amazing too um you know, I was really, I was really happy with, with how it worked out. Um, so I will be doing that again. Okay. And then, I don't know, let's see. Uh, it, so these, these do repost, um, the, the, the live chat. They, they take a, I don't know, like an hour usually to process because I talk for so long. Um, but so it will be there. Mo like lots of people tell me they use this like as a podcast to listen to at later times because I'm like, blah, 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 blah. Um, and then, um, other question, like, are we doing any more farmer's markets? And so this is the end of the season for us for, um, fresh flower farmer's markets. Um, we might see about being able to do the Christmas, like the farmer's market over the Christmas with the dried flowers. Um, but as of now, we only have, cause this was our Thanksgiving weekend. We only have fresh, fresh flowers in the stand 
for, I don't know, I don't know how many days until, until the flowers die. And they could die. I don't think they're dying tonight. And I don't think they're dying tomorrow. But they are probably dying soon. So the, the, end, the end of the season is nigh. <laughs> All right, well, thanks so much for hanging out. Um, as I said, I know this went crazy long. Um, not going to, can't commit to that going forward. But we are going to try to get back on the ball for Mondays. Um, you, not every week necessarily, but we, you know, ideally we like to get, you know, two lives in, you know, like every second week have like a public live for everyone. And then the first Monday of every month we have a members only live. Um, so yeah, so we're hoping to get back to that and we have videos coming. We have, uh, we have lots of stuff that we're editing up and it's from like the summer, it's from August because we're so behind on stuff. So it, it looks, it looks amazing. Everything looks really good. Lots, lots of stuff happening. Yeah, so happy Thanksgiving, everyone. Thanks for hanging out. Uh, what I'm grateful for this harvest season is all of you guys. Okay, Ian is finally texting me, so I gotta go. Okay, thanks everyone. See you.